Hello and welcome to another series of St. Michael's College Presents. I am delighted to introduce the speaker for today, which is my colleague Declan, Declan McCabe from the biology department. Declan, originally from Ireland, um, is a proud graduate of 1968 of Athlon Regional Technical College, which according to Declan has since been renamed twice. He came to the US for the summer in 1987 and is still here. <laughs> and he has earned his PhD in ecology from the University of Vermont and joined St. Michael's College faculty in 2001. Although stream macroinvertebrate biodiversity is a specialty, St. Michael's College has inspired him to explore biological diversity more broadly. Declan is instrumental, or has been instrumental, is still instrumental in the creation of uh, St. Michael's College Natural Area just across the street that is home to numerous invertebrates and vertebrates, and Declan makes sure that the biodiversity there is thriving. And he also has written a book about um, invertebrates in uh, rivers, and the title of this book is Turning Stones, Exploring Life in Freshwater, and will be published by Down East Press in 2024. So I give the stage to Declan McCabe. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for, so much for having me. <laughs> So uh, I, uh, I just had to correct one thing, not 1968, I would have been two. <laughs> but thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, there's another talk happening next week. We have a whole bunch of things happening for Earth Week. And uh, Sue Morse will be live streaming a talk from St. Mike's on April 27th. And anyone who's interested should grab a handout on the table out back. And uh, we hope you can all uh, stream in and see that. So that will be part of a series. So why do we care? What are we doing with biodiversity? And this is sort of the standard textbook thing you might see, and it demonstrates some of the ecosystem services, the things that we get for free from the environment that you could put a dollar value on if you cared to. So those are the selfish reasons, you know, clean air, clean water, things like that. Um, but there are also ethical reasons, and uh, one question we might have is, do species have the right to exist? And personally, I think they do. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of gall destroying some of them, but we've been doing it. So, um, you know, do we have the, the right to decide, who, who, you know, which species should exist and which should not? So that's kind of where we're heading. We're going to talk about some of that. And we have taken that decision uh, sometimes at random, and things just disappear, and uh, it, it usually comes down to us. So um, quickly, how we think about biodiversity is biodiversity at all levels. And I used a cheetah there as the poster child because the genetic diversity is so low in the wild cheetahs that it is a conservation concern and some disease could come through and quickly wipe them all out. So that's, that's genetic diversity. And uh, there was an issue in Florida with the Florida panther, for example, and the solution, they were going extinct because of a genetic bottleneck. And they brought in other panthers from elsewhere. And um, that was controversial because people were thinking, well, it's no longer a Florida panther, right? So um, your choices in that case were would you still have a population, or would you allow a pure population to go extinct? So I think they made the right decision, and we still have um, mountain lions down in Florida. So extinction is obviously one of the things we worry about with, um, with, with all of this biodiversity loss, the main thing in terms of species loss. And uh, obviously, zero is the, the number we stress about for any particular species. But before you get to zero, uh, you might actually have a functionally extinct uh, species. You may have a species that's gotten down to a handful and is doomed for whatever reason. Um, I never like to give up hope. I think it's, it's encouraging to think about the possibilities while a species still exists, but um, at some point the realists, you know, will, will rein me in. And then we have some things that are found only in zoos. So this is um, a kingfisher from Guam, and when they were approaching extinction because of an invasive species, they were rescued and brought to um, you know, Philadelphia, like you do. And uh, that's where they are, they're in the Philadelphia Zoo. And a subpopulation has been brought now to the National Zoo in DC as well. So that's where they're found. They're no longer found in Guam, um, where the brown tree snake would be eating them if they were there. So uh, 
what does that mean? Is the species extinct? Is it, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue. Anyway, um, we've had obviously the major geological uh, extinctions that we can talk about. I'm not gonna spend long because it will start to sound like general biology talk if I do. But um, the question, uh, the big one at the end there is where the dinosaurs all disappeared. That's the, the famous mass extinction. And the question many people are asking now is, are we in the next one? And are we the cause? Are we, in fact, ushering in a human-dominated era? Um, and if geologists a million years in the future were to dig down into the strata, would they notice a sudden lack of species caused by humans? And there's some debate, but uh, I think a lot of people are, would, would agree that there is. That's where we are. So um, one way to look at that mathematically is to think about the rates of extinction. And so uh, one of the historical estimates is that you lose one species per million species years. So if you had a million species existing for a year, you'd expect one of them to go extinct. That's kind of where that comes from. And um, some current rates estimated for birds, and birds are a really good organism to look at because you can actually walk into the forest and there are people, and some of them may be in this room, who would know every species of bird that could land or, or you know, I'm not that person, but um, such, such people exist. And we know that there's 179 documented species across the street, for example. They have been documented by the eBird people. They're wonderful, we love to have them on campus, and we use the data for teaching ecology. <laughs> and they, they gather the data for free, and they're happy to do it, they just love birds. But um, the estimate that they had there in recent decades is 100 times the background level, and um, it could be 1,000 times for the current century, and it could be even higher if we continue to lose forests. So. Uh, you might see where I'm going with this. Um, forest losses are, are one thing we're going to talk about and habitat loss in general. So these are you know, well-published people who know, you know they're gathering this information from the published literature. It's not like they woke up one morning and came up with nice round numbers, although they are nice and round, aren't they? <laughs> I, I'm not going to spend very long talking about these next few slides. Things are going extinct, and there are some big charismatic examples, and there are some big charismatic examples from the previous century. And, um, well, the moth, I guess, isn't that charismatic, but I like it, or I would have liked it. <laughs> it's it's a, a, a coconut moth that was um, eliminated entirely from the couple of islands where it lived by um, a uh, biological control organism that was introduced. So that was to protect the coconuts, and they did a really good job. The coconuts are safe, and the species is gone. <laughs> so um, earlier human-caused extinctions, you know, they're all well-documented. We went through a long period where species disappeared from islands. And so the, the dodo is a good example, the elephant bird's another example. And then earlier even than that, um, you know, people debate whether or not the humans caused the extinction of the megafauna, and we probably did. Um, but there's still lots and lots of published literature going back and forth about that question. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've been messing around. So uh, we should care for selfish reasons in addition to more ethical reasons. But uh, we are one with nature, and uh, we are part of that house of cards. Every breath you take is because something produced that oxygen. And uh, <laughs> we need intact systems. So we really are. Uh, Johnny Mitchell really was right for the folks of my generation. Um, we are million-year-old carbon. It's all cycled, and we're all part of the same system. So we need to take care of it, at least for selfish reasons. Um, so anyway, uh, do we know what we're losing? I, I pulled together uh, some new species descriptions just for fun. Um, people think that you have to go to the tropics and discover new species, and it's this grand adventure, and, and it is. It can be that. But uh, it can also be where you walk up out of the office one day and take some dirt and run it through a funnel, and species come out the other end that have never been described by science. And so um, this is uh, Felipe Soto Adams' work. He was at UVM. I don't know if, he was, if you overlapped with him or not, but he was... He was at UVM when I was there, and uh, this is one of the species he described. And this was a springtail discovered in an artificial wetland created by, say, by UVM to clean up Centennial Brook. So there's a little artificial wetland, and he went out one day and discovered a new species about a 10-minute walk from his office. And he named it after Ross Bell. So it's um, Ross I is the species name, and Ross Bell is a kind of a local hero among invertebrates. And the second species is named for Joyce Bell, which is also, I think, kind of nice. 
um, he had a lot of respect for these two people doing their, their scientific work, and uh, it was, it was uh, very fun to see them described. And the last one was named for Champ. <laughs> and the one named for Champ was discovered in a Superfund site at the end of Pine Street in Burlington. So the point I'm making is there's lots and lots of species that have not yet been described. There's one described by Joe Shaw, who just retired. He's, a, he's another uh, UVM um, parasitologist. And if you care to describe small things, you could describe species for your entire career. And the, the other one on there, I don't know this gentleman, Robert, um, but that was also described from Chittenden County, so a, a new beetle. So, you know, the species are out there. Um, some things are described from extinct species. These were taken off the feathers of the Carolina parakeet from museum specimens. So uh, there was, these species are specific to the Carolina parakeet, and therefore they're also extinct because they went extinct with the parakeet, which is the host. <laughs> And once in a while, a St. Mike student discovers a new species. And so this is uh, Mindy Kudrum, who was on study abroad in South America. And she did, in fact, have the adventure where you go to South America and discover a new species. And uh, proof that there's life after college, she went off and got herself a job in conservation. And now she's with an environmental consultant. So it can be done. <laughs> anyway, where do, why do we lose species? Habitat loss is a big one. Um, we're going to focus on that today. That's mostly what we're going to talk about. Introduced species we'll talk a little bit about. Um, Overharvesting we'll talk less about. And uh, global change is usually the thing that hits the newspapers, but uh, it's fourth on the list in terms of what's causing extinction. So there we go. Habitat loss is, that, you know, we have, you know, done significant damage to habitat. And so that picture right there is, is taken in South America, and you can see sort of the fragmentation that's happening. And it's not just the destruction, it's the fact that only small patches are left. And imagine you're a jaguar, something that has an extensive home range. That patch is entirely useless to you, right? Unless you can jump between patches at night, which is what our bobcats are doing, actually. Um, our corridors in Vermont are functioning more like stepping stones. So our bobcats are finding places to bed down at night in these remnant forests and following the riverbeds, going under the highway. We've got the proof. We've seen them go through on the cameras. Um, you know, that bobcats are stitching it together, but bobcats are more tolerant of people than some of our larger species. So, overharvesting. I'm going to skip the overharvesting. Um, there's, there's enough, I think there's enough in here without getting too far into that. I do want to talk a little bit about shifting baselines. Um, one of the questions to, that people ask is, well, what's normal? And, and normal is such a, a relative concept. And so that cartoon shows you the driving that I would have experienced, you know, in 1990. Um, but in 2020, you don't experience that type of driving because the insect numbers are down. I asked my students in class today, because I, I did a dry run in class. I forced my students to look, look at the talk. And uh, most of them learned to drive in 2020 or 2019. So normal for them is not getting your windshield crusted up with bugs. Bug numbers are down dramatically. So, None of us truly remember normal. There is no normal. Um, I don't care how old you happen to be or I happen to be. Normal is, is, is not something any of us have experienced. So um, there's the, the popular study among ecologists is to go back and repeat your thesis work just as you're about to retire. And there's very cool comparative studies have been done. You go back and do that thesis work that you did 20, 30 years ago, and you get a different answer because things have changed. But that's not far enough back. So, you know, it's not, it's not the right comparison. Hopefully, we won't reach this point. Um, but, uh, yeah, watch out. So, um, is this normal? Is this a normal backyard? What do you think? Does this look like a normal backyard to you? So, I'll tell you what I did here. I sat on the deck on Saturday, and I turned on an app called Merlin, and I just had it listen to the birds. And this is what it came up with. So, um, see, we've got three students. Okay. So, what do you think students think? Is that a normal backyard? Who's going to answer first? You think it's a normal backyard? Okay, so you win the prize. <laughs> Are you ready to catch? Because I might not get back up and, oh, almost. That, that's worth getting. That's worth getting. What do you guys think? You think it's a normal backyard? Yeah? You also think it's normal? Okay, you get to share this prize, which I can't throw. <laughs> so you get the polite version of it being actually handed to you. You have to share it. It's a more shareable prize. <laughs> so um, one of the gifts of being a biologist is that your predecessors 
cannot throw away their field guides, but they also don't want to keep them when they retire. And so I have inherited a collection of field guides, and I've got one from 1947. And so I looked up these birds, and for two of these birds, this is not a normal condition. So this is the cardinal, which extends up as far as south, southern end of New York in 1947. And this is the tuft of titmouse, which made it all the way to northern New Jersey in 1947, right? So things have changed just a little bit for those two species. And I looked up a few more just for fun. Uh, the catbird, which is super common in my backyard, rarely makes it to southern New England in 47. And the yellow-bellied sap, sap sucker, southern New England occasionally. <laughs> so um, while politicians were doing their best to deny climate change, the birds were going about their business and shifting with the climate. And uh, here, here they are. You know, and the reason I even know or care about this is um, uh, Ellen Martinson has done some really cool work on um, loons, and in particular on the parasites in, loon, in loons. And if you look at a textbook on parasitology from 15 years ago, it will say loons are not susceptible to malaria. And in fact, now loons are susceptible to malaria, and it's because of these birds moving north, and the insect vectors, and therefore the malarial parasites. And so our loons are dying from malaria because of climate change. So things are changing. And um, we, we, we can't sit back and say, well, you know, it's not that different from what it used to be. It, it's quite different. Uh, this one made it only as far as Delaware. <laughs> and if you look at eBird, they're all over the place. Uh, they're not as common as some of the other species, though. So um, one of the reasons for the climate change that we're having and for the diversity loss we're having is that we now dominate in terms of the biomass, and this, this example is from mammals. Obviously, we're mammals. In terms of mammal diversity and mammal biomass, we are this black circle in the middle. And here are our cattle over here. And the only bits of color you see are the wild mammals. So this is a study that came out in 23, and um, the illustrations I got from the Wiseman Institute, I emailed them and said, hey, can I steal your images? And they're like, yep, just give us credit. <laughs> And so I love the way they've illustrated this. Um, you know, it hardly seems like a normal condition, right? And so you'll see where I'm going. There are too many of us, and we've got too many animals. One solution is to eat lower in the food web. So eat more plants. That definitely would help, and we would have fewer of the cattle. But um, we'll, we'll talk more about what we can do for habitat instead of that in a second. So where am I going? Who knows? Um, this is all the depressing information, and we're going to move on now and say, what can we do? because there's lots we can do. And so this is Aldo Leopold, and I like this quote. One of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And uh, I'm a cheerful guy, and I can't live there. So I have to say, what can we do? And that's, that's where we're heading. So can we heal? What has happened? What can happen? And I believe we can. Um, I don't believe in the word restoration. Um, and I'd like you to think about the example of a 57-year-old guy who's overweight. Would you expect to restore him to the state of a 20-year-old? Would that be reasonable? No? Any votes for no? Yes? No? OK. I don't think it's reasonable. But you sure as hell can do some rehab. You sure as hell could be fitter. You sure as hell could improve. You sure as hell could have cardiovascular fitness. So I don't think we can restore habitats, but I do think we can rehab them. And I do think they can be better than they are. So that's where I'm heading. Um, the humans, there's too many of us. And um, I was asked to participate in the discussion recently of Laudata Sai, which is a document produced by the, um, uh, the Pope about biodiversity. And the one thing he doesn't talk, talk about is population. And we do need to talk about population. And it turns out we are reaching a peak. Oh, and I'm reminded, for you students, this is an uplift event. Thank you for attending an uplift event. Um, Uplift encourages, supports programs that promote self-awareness, understanding, cultural competency. Have you heard this before? Okay. Have you heard this before also? Okay, well, here you are. We want our students to live honestly, respectfully, inclusively, while doing well and doing good. And this program today provides an opportunity for you to learn and grow in global citizenship, interpersonal development, and our personal wellness. So we're going with the global citizenship part of it today. Sound fair? All right. There is a QR code at the back for tracking your activity if you're tracking these things. And um, Liz is managing that, right? Still there if you, want, if you guys want that. There you go. Anyway, so human population is, in fact, peaking. So um, we will, in fact, reach a maximum that the models suggest by the end of the century. 
and the models from there vary about how fast we'll decline. We tend to live a long time, so um, relative to many animals, so we will decline slowly. So the question is, what will we have for our new smaller population? What will the Earth look like? What animals will be here? What plants will be here? And that's where I want to go. And so one of my ecological heroes is E.O. Wilson, Edward Wilson. I've never met him, but I know one person in the audience has. Somebody met, you met him, right? <laughs> Which is pretty cool. I mean, you know, that's, that's famous by association right there. <laughs> so uh, uh, Kurt is part of the um, Vermont Half Earth Institute, if I've got the name right. I have it right on, on the slide that's coming. So uh, you'll, see, you'll see it, it's the Alliance for, uh, we'll get there, we'll get there. Anyway, um, uh, Ed Wilson was a, an ant biologist and um, general conservationist. And uh, if you've ever opened the textbook in the ecology section, you cannot avoid the work that he has done. It's amazing. And so his idea was that we should preserve half of the earth for biological diversity. And um, it might seem like a tall order, but when you think about it, think about Boreal Canada, for example, and how much acreage there is there. Think about the oceans and uh, the ocean preserves that have already been created. Um, the, the, you know, we have a ways to go, there's no doubt, but um, this is, a, a, I, I believe, a very hopeful goal. So, how do you protect the earth? You can go yard by yard, and we're going to talk about um, Doug Tallamy's homegrown national park in a second. Um, you can go campus by campus. We're doing tree campus right here. We've gotten tree campus two years in a row. Um, and you can go church by church. That's why St. Catherine is up there. She is a Mohawk saint, and um, there's an organization that is looking at church properties and saying, what can you do for diversity? And the Sisters of Mercy have a great place down in Benson. They've really been, been working on, on that. And we have our own place that you'll see across the street, street in a second. Um, we've got you know, the Vermont Family Forest, Family Forest Organization, um, and they are looking at people who own forest, and they are trying to help with biodiversity in those forests and, and better management. And of course, we've got the Vermont Alliance for Half Earth. There we go. I did better this time because I stole it from your website. <laughs> so uh, we can, we're can we working in the state, and, and there's lots of ways to do this, lots of organizations doing it. And so um, Kurt is here from the Vermont Alliance for Half Earth, uh, Earth and um, the, the textbook that he has written by a bunch of Vermont authors um, is really excellent in terms of the things that we can do to improve diversity locally. So we'll talk about some of the ideas from there. And what can we each do? Um, we can educate. So Vermont Master Naturalist is a program that Alicia runs, and that gets together a whole bunch of people who are interested in this type of thing. And I participated a couple of years ago, and I learned a ton. I've been an ecologist for 20 years before I started doing it, but it was st I still learned a ton. And uh, there's always more to learn. Vote. Um, look at what your candidates are, are, are doing, and vote for the candidates that best represent your values. And then when they get in, you should contact them and tell them what you want. Because how else will they know? So email your candidates. They're, they're, they're out there. And email your elected officials. And they will respond. You know, one, one of our candidates locally, um, I'm going to mention her name because she's going to get elected whether I mention her name or not. Ginny Lyons is a biologist. And she's always been very supportive. And, you know, you can email these people and they'll get back to you because it's Vermont and it's small. But you also, if you're from out of state, can email your officials as well. You'll be surprised how few people do email them. So do that, organize. Uh, some of you students are in green up. And the reason we have campus composting is because long before Vermont, Vermont insisted on comp composting, our students insisted on it. And the way they did this was to confiscate the trash cans from the cafeteria and instead replace it with a tarp and force all of their peers to scrape all the plates onto the tarp and make a massive mountain and photograph it and bring the photograph to the president's office. And composting came in in short order. So you've got the power. Students are, in fact, the customers here. And you do have the power to change the college. And you have done so successfully. So keep organizing and get involved. Get involved at a local level in your hometown. Get involved on the conservation commissions. Um, change the world. Take over those conservation commissions, because they have a hard time getting volunteers anyway. So, and you will educate them. And that top piece right there, education, doesn't apply, well, it applies to everybody. It doesn't just apply to kindergarten or grade school or college. It, apply, you know, it really applies to um, the administrators. You need to educate your administrators. Some of them have biological backgrounds, like our recent vice, pres vice president, but some of them don't. So it's, it's important to 
emphasize to your, your administrators and your town leaders what matters. And plant, we're gonna talk a lot about planting. I talked a little bit about species diversity, and what I wanna do is talk about habitat diversity instead. And I'm a stream person, so here's a bunch of terms that occurred to me earlier today when I was like a typical student putting my presentation together at the last minute. And pools are flat water, riffles are flowing water. You've got areas of shady habitat. You've got areas that are exposed to the sun, areas that are exposed to the current. You've got logs, you've got branches, you've got eddies, you've got runs, you've got upstream, downstream ends of a rock, which are different microhabitats. You've got bedrock, cobbles, which are like the size of your fist, gravel, sandbars, mid-channel islands. All of those things are different habitats. And so the reason, for example, that we have the cobblestone tiger beetle in Vermont is because there are mid-channel islands in the Winooski River. And you can go there and you can still find them. But because we dam our rivers, we simplify the habitat, and we've reduced the number of those islands. We've pushed them upstream to a certain, you know, you can find them as far as Richmond. You get a little bit below Richmond, you start running out of them because the water is flatter as you go farther downstream. So these are all different pieces of habitat, pieces of the puzzle, and different things like different areas. And so if you want a diverse habitat in terms of rivers, you want all of these things. What you don't want is this, right? So pick your movie, is it Greece? Maybe that's a good one to think about. Think about all those Hollywood movies where the 1950s cars are lined up side by side in the concrete river basin. I mean, that's what they've done to many rivers to efficiently move the water out and make sure there's not flooding in Los Angeles. And it's very effective for flood control, but it absolutely is a terrible habitat, right? And we do that to many streams. We channelize them, we turn them into a sewer and there are things that like to live there. There's a species or two that really likes that rushing water, but you've missed all of the other species that want the riffles and the runs and the pools and the snags. They're all gone. So you've killed your diversity. So um, we know this. Uh, it's hard to do the career-long habitat thing where you say, what was it like before? What's it like now? That's no good. But you can do a comparison now and ask yourself, in this case, here's the most forested land Here's the least forested land, and here's a number of insect species in the river. And this was all done by um, Janelle Roberge when she was a student at St. Mike's. And each of these dots is a river that she visited and sampled. And you can see that an undergraduate data set demonstrates cleanly that we need forested streams, right? That's, I'm convinced, I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> and here's what a stream can look like in an urban area. And, uh, which, which photograph would you put on your globalized calendar? The one of the concrete basin or this one? This, this is the prize winning photo. <laughs> so I stole this off the globalized uh, calendar this year. So when she got back from South Korea, she put a photograph in the competition and gave me permission to use it. So uh, you can mention, tell her if anyone knows her, tell her. I, I, I put her name on the slide. So we can re rehabilitate, we can make things better. And there are wonderful global examples um, students, how many of you are stressed about the hole in the ozone layer? Anyone stressed about that a little bit? Not a lot, okay. So I got, um, if I was teaching a course to you 15 years ago, you would have been stressed about it because I would have emphasized how worrisome that was and the ultraviolet was coming to kill us all. We we're all gonna die from skin cancer. Um, but here's what's happening. Um, we got together intelligently and came up with the Montreal Protocol in the late 80s and the hole in the ozone layer got smaller and smaller, and this is ozone concentration predicted into the future to improve continuously because we agreed to fix it. And we can do that, we have that power. Um, here's a, an animal that a lot of people care about, and uh, that animal we almost lost. Um, used to be shot routinely. Bounties were paid because people were convinced it was taking livestock, which it doesn't. I mean, maybe if you've got bunnies out in the backyard, it might take a bunny once in a while, but mostly they eat fish. But they paid bounties for them for a long time until they decided it was a bad idea. And in 1940, they put in a, a law to protect them, which sounds like the end of the story, except that in 1945, we started selling a, a pesticide called DDT, which is a really good insecticide, except that it goes through the food chain, accumulates, and weakens the shells uh, of the eggs, and then they, they can't incubate the eggs. Um, in 1962, an influential, influential scientist wrote a book called Silent Spring, which really influenced a lot of people. And it emphasizes again why we need to educate. 
And it, we need to educate everybody. It's not just the choir, which I, I suspect is who's sitting in the room. We need to go more broadly. So um, things got continued, and we got down to 417 nesting pairs in all of the lower 48 states of the United States. That's how, far, how bad it got. And then in 1972, there was finally a ban on DDT in the United States. Still used in some places, um, some parts of the world, for mosquito control in houses. Um, and there's a debate, it's controversial. You know, your, if your choice was malaria or DDT, which way are you gonna go? Um, it's not simple, it's not as simple as we might like it to be. And say, we should ban it, of course, everywhere, but you know, it's not that simple. Um, and there are alternatives and approaches, but um, it is banned in the US. So, uh, anyone want to guess what was the last state to have bald eagles nesting? Any takers? Oh, well, uh, no, the, sorry, sorry, the last one to have nesting bald eagles. So, in other words, they had zero and then they had some. Who, is the la who are the last people who got the oh, bald eagles? It is us, yeah. <laughs> so we did, in fact, get the bald eagles back. One of my colleagues was a little bitter about it because they were nesting on a, a, river, a river island in the Connecticut River. And he was, he was thinking, ah, that should be a Vermont island anyway. And we should, in fact, have nesting eagles. But we didn't for quite a while. When I got to Vermont, we didn't have nesting bald eagles. So we do now, and this is an old data set that shows when they came back. And more recent data shows a much more hopeful picture. We have, we have bald eagles. And you can see that we're, those green bars are babies being born each year, and we're you know, getting up to 40s, which is encouraging. And um, you know, they come right onto campus, which is cool. There was a, a time when my, another professor and I were taking a walk with two groups of students. The group was too big, and because of COVID rules, we had to split them, even though we were outside. This is very early in the pandemic. And as the two groups came back to a trail intersection, a bald eagle circled about four times over the, 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 the lot of us. And so a whole bunch of undergraduate students from Boston and Florida and wherever else got to see a bald eagle in the wild on their own campus, which made me feel good. So uh, uh, Vins came by and put out some deer carcasses to study um, black vultures. And the first thing that landed in front of the camera was a beautiful bald eagle. So uh, this is the stuff that makes me happy. And I get paid for this, which is kind of shocking. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. So we fixed it. That, that we did actually address this problem. Um, are there as many as there were before? I seriously doubt it, but more than we had at the trough when there were a serious problem. So, what are we doing? Um, the short version is we have made a natural area and a few things have happened. It's, it's, it's two thirds of campus is a natural area, which you know is pretty good for any campus, I think. So we're, we're trying to live the half earth thing by, by going past half. <laughs> Uh, we did have a farming lease going with corn for a while to feed the cattle across the river, and uh, we made an agreement. We, we terminated the lease. Um, it's a sensitive Vermont thing to take land out of farming, and so I want to be sensitive to that and describe what, exactly what we did. We approached the farmer and explained what we were going to do, and he said, can I have another year so I can plan for this? And we agreed, and in return, he came in the following year and he cover cropped even areas he didn't have to cover crop. And he put in winter rye, which is a, the, the perfect cover crop for a situation where you're trying to go back to nature because it grows for a while and it doesn't self-seed terribly well, um, but it puts some organic material in the ground, it reduces soil erosion, and then it just dies out and gets replaced by other vegetation. So, you know, it's really nice that we were able to do that peacefully. I'm sure he'd rather still be farming and he did farm it for 35 years. So, uh, you know, farming is an important tradition in Vermont, and I don't want to in any way disrespect it, but it's a college campus, and we decided we wanted it for education and research and, and recreation, and that's what we're doing. So, uh, we planted trees today down there. Um, Heather Fitzgerald had her class down there, and they planted 20 sycamores, which was pretty, pretty fun. I'll show you photos in a second. So, this is what the cornfield looked like after the last harvest, and that's a couple of faculty members planting sycamores back then, those trees that were planted, and you don't, can't even see the trees in the picture, there were sticks, and the sticks went in. They had roots on them, but they were basically sticks, and they are now 17 feet tall, and that's only since 2019. There's so much phosphorus in the ground down there left over from the agriculture that trees love it, and if you put in the right ones, they'll grow. Um, so, uh, a few things I want to talk about is what we should plant and why. 
Um, planting for diversity is the first thing I wanted to talk about. Um, there is no perfect tree, although architects will tell you otherwise. And they told us for many years that ash trees were perfect, and we put in a lot of them, which is a bit of a problem. Um, different trees like different places. Like There's a couple of wet places on campus, and I know if we stuck in some shrub willows, they wouldn't be wet anymore. And plus, people wouldn't walk in there because there'd be you know, shrub willows growing there. So that, you know, there are solutions that uh, you put the right tree in the right place, it's, it's good. And the one on the right is another um, one that was everyone's favorite tree. This is elm. And Burlington, Vermont was famous for being wall-to-wall -wall elms until something came and took care of them all and the elms are gone because of Dutch elm disease. Um, not sure what's happening with the mic, but we'll survive. This is the American chestnut. And literally billions of these things disappeared because of another disease. So uh, there you go. All right. So I think we should be planting for the food web. And what I mean by that is if we put in more tree species, we attract more insect species. And then your birds can have a balanced diet. And so you can actually enrich the food web by starting at the bottom, putting in the right trees, the right plants, and working on up through the insects. And then the birds will actually come back. So. Um, when the American chestnut went, for example, there were 60 moth species that, that we know reliably ate that species. Seven of those ate nothing else. Like, they were total specialists. And one paper came out saying, well, we haven't collected this one since 1936, must be gone. And then, of course, years later, somebody found it in the 90s. So it's not gone. You know, it's a hopeful story. I'm not sure about the other six species, but... Um, one thing that's happening right now is people get iNaturalist accounts and they photograph cool bugs and cool birds and cool everything else and they load it up and they share the data all over the place. So get yourself an iNaturalist account and you can be part of the documentation of these species. So one thing you can do is plant, plant trees that are good for the specialists. And this is um, one of my favorite beetles right there. Um, it's the willow calligraphy beetle. And surprisingly, they eat willows and nothing else, okay? And so if you wanted a plant to bring that species back, that's great, but guess what? There's 415 butterfly and moth species that will eat that, that will also eat willows. So you've planted, for you, bring back your favorite beetle, and you have fed 415 butterflies and moths. And I'll explain in a minute why I care about the butterflies and moths rather than other things. And this is some of um, Adelaide Tyrell Murphy's artwork She's amazing, a Vermont artist, and she draws a lot for Northern Woodlands Magazine and The Outside Story and things like that. And um, yeah, she's been doing this for such a long time. I found a book with her name on it from uh, decades back. I was like, you, you must have been drawing these things when you were six, because she's, she's amazing. Anyway, um, uh, one of my favorite beetles around here is the locust borer. They're just spectacular. It's a large black and yellow beetle. And if you pick it up, it buzzes like a yellow jacket and you would be convinced that you'd picked up a yellow jacket. It's a perfect mimic. When it, when it pops out, when beetles fly, they pop out their elytra, and the wings come out from underneath. And in most beetles, it's a different color underneath. This thing is black and yellow underneath. So it's a perfect mimic even when it's flying. And I have dropped them more times because I was, I was sure I'd accidentally picked up a yellow jacket. Anyway, they only eat black locust. So plant some black locust. And the black locust is good for another 52 butterfly and moth species. So, you know, you've, you've done some good. And as it happens, the black locust is also good for the pollinators. They produce these beautiful flowers uh, high up in the canopy, and, and you've got, you know, wonderful pollinator food from a native species. So another thing you could plant. Not as good as willow in terms of the number of species, but it's important not to just plant willow. You need diversity, right? We also should be planting for pollinators, but not just for the pollinators. So this is a, a butterfly bush on the right, and sure enough, just as the name advertises, it's great for butterflies, including monarchs. They love to get them to come down and get some nectar, right? So it's great for them, but not much eats the leaves. Now, a traditional gardener would say, and that's why I planted it, because nothing eats it. But from a food web point of view, you've done nothing to improve the environment. You really haven't fed anything except, of course, in the case of the nectar, which is great, but you could have planted milkweed, okay? And the milkweed is good for pollinators, and it feeds another 10 moth, moth, uh, butterflies and moths. It also feeds some beetle species and a whole bunch of other things. So the butterflies are happy. They'll get their nectar. Um, you don't get butterflies unless you've had caterpillars. 
So, you, you know, that, you get the logic. We need to be planting native vegetation that'll feed native insects, that'll feed native birds. And, and why am I obsessing on caterpillars? Why not beetles? Why not true bugs? Why not something else? Um, the reason is they are soft and squishy and easy to shove into a baby bird. And this comes from Doug Ptolemy's book, which we'll talk about in a second, actually, next. Um, Doug Ptolemy is um, famous for his homegrown national park. He's from the University of Delaware, and he's great. Um, I, I emailed him out of the blue one year in December because I was having a senior seminar, and I was using his book anyway, and I said, hey, uh, any chance you would uh, come and give a talk on campus? He says, no, he says, I've been to Vermont recently, and you guys had him in Vermont recently, that's why he was up here recently. And he says, but I'll tell you what, he says, I'll zoom in any time you want. So he zoomed into class, and I set it up so he could share screen and, and, and show slides. No, nah, no, nah, he says, I'm not doing that. He says, go with questions. And our students were ready. They rose to the occasion, and they filled the full hour with questions. And if you want to hear the discussion, uh, look up Nature Snippets podcast, and you can find it. We, he gave us permission to put it out as a podcast. He just wants to get the word out, and he has no compulsion about how the word gets out, as long as it gets out. He wants you to plant native vegetation. He wants to encourage caterpillars. He wants to encourage birds. And he's got a recipe. So, and and uh, he's, he's got this amazing website, um, which hooks directly to this website, which tells you what to plant and where. So you can go in there, look by zip code. It's National Wildlife Federation. And it literally ranks your trees by which ones are best to plant based on the number of species of caterpillars that will grow on it, right? And so the, ki the king of the lot is actually willow in Vermont. But there's a whole, you know, red oak is good. There's a whole bunch of things that are really, really good to have around here. And so we try to have as many of them as we can. And um, there are also links within that website to tell you where to buy these things. Where can you buy, you know, reliably buy these plants? So lots of things we can do. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit less time talking about invasives. Invasives are a difficult nut to crack. Um, but uh, you, this is the time of year when you will see published articles about eating invasive species. So we should eat um, Japanese knotweed, for example. I tried it. I wasn't fond of it, honestly. And I couldn't eat enough of it to really make a dent. I mean, I'm just not that hungry. You know, what can I tell you? Um, yeah. Can I just say? Yeah. Yeah. And sugar it up and put it in vanilla ice cream and stir it in, and it's like better than, it's, it's a little akin to rhubarb. Whoa! It was delicious. <laughs> Well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Um, I, 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 I've, I've come up, I've invented a new product here um, to, to another way to deal with invasive species. Th these are the invasive coasters. And so I invented these on Sunday. And I said to my daughter, hey, I've invented an, an invasive beer mats. And she says, what's a beer mat? So she rechristened them invasive coasters. And uh, you, anyone who wants one can come up and grab them. Um, I haven't the energy or time to, to market these things. But if you've got a good friend who... Uh, who uh, has a bandsaw and they like to play with wood and do it safely, we're, we're a screen, uh, you know, we're a, a shield because uh, as you get down near the end, if it gets hold of the log, it'll just wing it at you. So uh, you've got to do it carefully. It's not something for the faint of heart, but the students should probably convince Brian Collier in the art department that this would be a good idea. <laughs> He's an original thinker, though. He's not going to want my idea. But maybe you could convince him you could cut up some more knotweed. Or not knotweed. The, these are actually um, buckthorn. And... To make a good coaster, you need a big buckthorn. And those are the ones we need you to cut, because those are the ones that produce the big blackberries that the birds love, but then they give the birds diarrhea. And so the birds rapidly shed, shed those seeds and rapidly replant the buckthorn all over the place. So nutritionally, they're very bad for our birds. And um, yeah, big ones, cut the big ones. And we have no shortage on campus, and we have been cutting them. Um, there are better ways. If we had a lot, of, if we had the time and energy to go out and dose them with chemicals, that might improve things faster. But uh, what I have learned, I learned this in Red Rocks Park. It's better to cut them off about this high, because then you know where they are. 
because why else would there be a tree cut off this high? But if you know they're there, then when you see them sprouting again, you can just knock off the, the extra sprouts. If you knock them off often enough, they'll be dead. They need to photosynthesize. So if you're visiting a trail and you just, you know, bring a, I, I, this is kind of sound weird, but I bring a machete sometimes and I knock off those little, little uh, shoots and you will in fact kill the, 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 um, the buckthorn. Um, if you've got an applicator's license and the time and energy to do the, the chemical stuff, well, you can. Um, invasives, that's the other reason we plant for diversity. So uh, if you plant a whole bunch of things that are identical, like the 88 mature ash trees on our campus, then you are really at risk of something coming and eating them all. And that little beautiful bug living on top of the penny there is the emerald ash borer. And currently the emerald ash borer is at the highway exit over by Costco. And I can walk through the woods to that location in 20 minutes. So they're coming, and they are coming for our 88 ash trees. And you could inject all of those 88 ash trees with toxic chemicals at a cost of $2,000 every two years, and then every leaf is toxic, and every insect that might eat that is, is going to be killed. Or you can let them go because it's sad, but they're going to go. Um, so you need to plan for diversity, and that's what we're doing. So on Friday, we're putting in 21 mature trees, the biggest trees we can put in the ground, and still have them survive. And Trevian's leading the charge on that. And 21 trees going in, 18 species. That's what I mean by planting for diversity. And um, we're not just putting in 21 of the perfect species for our campus. We're planting for diversity. You might wonder what all these strange photographs are doing here. There's two uh, big cultural implications of losing all of the ash. Um, in Vermont, the most important one is that we're losing the basket making tradition of the Abnaki. The most sensitive species in terms of the emerald ash borer is the black ash, which is the only way that they can make their traditional baskets. So that's, that's a real cultural loss. The other one is uh, these are hurley sticks from the national sport where I came from. And you might wonder what possible connection to Vermont. I was at the Champlain Valley Expo. There was a, you know, those industry type things that they have at the fair and they had Vermont wood products, and one of the things was an Irish hurley stick. I was like, hang on a second. I said, those are made in you know, County Cork. I even know where the factory is. And the guy's like, ah, yes, he says, but they're made from Vermont ash. And what they do is they, they harvest the trees about yeah high off the ground, and they send, they send all of that stuff off for traditional lumber. And then they were coming in with a backhoe and digging up the rest, the rootstock, and sending that to Ireland in a shipping container. And what, what's necessary is the, um, the wood grain that goes down into the woodstock and curves to make these sticks so that they don't split. And so they'll have to get their ash somewhere else now because Vermont is quarantined um, for emerald ash borers. Okay, so um, another thing happening on campus in the art department, we've got Brian Collier, and Brian's program is called The Unlawning of America, a call to inaction. He wants you to stop doing something. Just stop cutting the grass. I mean, if, do you deeply love cutting the grass anyway? I know some people who do, but it's not my favorite thing to do, I have to say. So if you stop cutting the grass, other things will actually grow. If you walk down into our natural area, you'll see that our trails are beautifully grassy. We never planted a single grass seed. The only reason that those trails are grassy is because we run a lawnmower over them, and that's what keeps them in that condition. There's not a single grass seed planted down there. But that's where the grass has survived by natural selection, or in this case, unnatural selection, I like with the lawnmower, right? So um, a couple of areas on campus, on the main campus, we have no mow zones, and the no mow zones are signposted, and we just stop cutting, and things grow. And then once in a while, one of us might go in there and do a bit of gorilla gardening, and uh, a couple of trees have showed up that I don't think showed up on their own. <laughs> and a couple more are going to go in this week, and we're going to put in some sycamore. Um, I mentioned on one of the slides something called assisted migration. And this is a little bit controversial for some folks, but uh, the climate's warming, the birds are moving north, the insects are moving north. It's harder for the trees to move north. So we are moving some trees north. So we're right at the edge of the sycamore's natural distribution. So we're increasing our density of sycamore on campus. And there, aren't, there were none before we started. They just wouldn't get here on their own. So, <clears throat> We're moving them a little bit. Excuse me. We've put in some tulip poplars. Sure as heck wouldn't get here on their own. <clears throat> They're more common in Pennsylvania, places like that. 
So, <clears throat> like uh, Chicago politics, vote early, vote often. Plant early, plant often. <clears throat> People say the best time to plant a tree would have been 20 years ago. <clears throat> Second best is today. So keep planting. And this literally was today. <clears throat> These are students in Heather's class. Heather Fitzgerald. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is gone. One second. <clears throat> ah, this might work. So, those students planted those trees today. Um, sycamore grows fabulously well here. And uh, we're happy with those. And yeah, this is good timing actually. This is the last slide. <laughs> uh, Branch Out Burlington has provided a bunch of our trees. Um, Margaret Skinner is a UVM entomologist and she is like the cheerleader for an army of volunteers who plant trees. And those trees, when they get big enough, have to go and get planted somewhere else. And she donates them to whoever will plant them. And when she can't find a donor who want someone to accept them, she calls us up and says, hey, can you take 60 sycamores? And I always say yes. And I send emails around to professors and say, hey, you want to plant some trees with your students? And they do. And I learned this from, from Trevian, who's been working with them longer than I have. And so uh, Trevian started the, the, the ball on that. The next thing she has, Trevian, is red buds. She's got a lot of red buds. Want those? I thought you might. <laughs> so Arbor Day uh, has also been generous. Word had gotten out that we were planting trees, and Colchester had the free tree day during the pandemic, and the people who were supposed to get the trees, 17 of them didn't show up, and they said, can you take 17 trees? I said, yes, we can. I drove over there with a truck. While I was there, the Arbor Day people said, hey, you should go, to, go over to Winooski as well. I ended up with 65 trees in the back of the truck. And there were bigger trees, and we're happy with those. St. Mike's has been super supportive. Um, those of you who are involved in colleges, churches, any kind of institution that has some land, um, ask the administrator, uh, can you do something different with that land? And if they say no, wait for that administrator to retire and ask the next one. And that's been a good strategy for us. Um, Vermont Alliance for Half Earth has a wonderful book in the lobby and uh, they are really encouraging us to uh, do more and uh, go for the 30 by 30, which is legislation that's coming through. So 30% of Vermont protected by 3030. Uh, 2030, sorry. <laughs> Let's do it a century earlier. <laughs> uh, a millennium earlier. Anyway, uh, and then uh, I, we'd love to get the 50 by 50, right? So uh, we can protect more land. You can protect your backyard, get rid of some of that lawn. You can protect whatever organization you work with. So I think I'll stop there. And the Vermont, uh, this, the, the Vermont Master Naturalist Program, are also spreading education around the basin and getting a lot more people involved. And it's exciting to see it go town by town. If your town needs a, a Vermont astronautics program, contact Alicia Daniels, UVM. And uh, we'll stop. You're doing Colchester? We are. Next, not fall 2023, fall I would like to do Colchester, yeah. yeah Colchester, Winooski, Burlington, sort of a lower Winooski program. We want to do like a unified, yes. Yes, OK. Yes. We'll talk. We'll talk. I have a good site that might be interesting to you. I would it's only 365 acres, but they're nice acres. <laughs> <laughs> Any old questions at all? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> questions? I guess I'd just like to make an observation. Sure. Thank you. This is, I just love this talk. Well, thank you. It was, yeah, I always like to hear what you have to say and the research you do and how you back up some of the things I know instinctively, but you <laughs> find the numbers and uh, really lay the story out so beautifully. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I guess I just wanted to make a quick observation, which is as people start to approach landowners about retiring land from lawn, uh, one thing that s surprised me and then it seemed intuitive is that the lawn they want to retire most quickly are the steeper. If you can find a steep slope somewhere, they're having a mowing problem anyway. Or if you can find a wet spot, you know, where they're having trouble getting in there. Those are places it's pretty easy to get a first ask, you know? So it's kind of designing with nature. Yeah. Like, where is it hard to mow? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, yeah. it's like the classic win-win environmentalism. Yes. We went after the college administration about electric lights 
and we said to them, you know, here are the numbers. And the Greenup organization, the students again led this, um, you, these lights will pay themselves back. If you convert from incandescence or from um, you know, the older fluorescence and convert to uh, LEDs, they'll pay for themselves in four years. And they also did the homework and connected us with um, Efficiency Vermont. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the installation was paid for by the Efficiency Vermont. So we minimal environmentalism, and that's a prime example. Go for the steep places, go for the wet places, go for the places where lawn does not want to be. Exactly. And you don't want to roll over your tractor and kill yourself. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, and we're mapping the same things on campus. We just sent a new map to facilities and said, here's where we'd like to go next with the no mow zones. So, yeah. and you know, the places that people don't care about, you know, we're not going for the playing fields. No, exactly. We're not going for the lawn at the president's house. You know, that's, that's the lawn and they look out on it and they're happy and they use it. They have parties on that lawn for, for, for guests. But the parts, parts that are not being used as lawn, God, let's ditch them. Let's just get rid of them. <laughs> so yeah, other questions or thoughts? Thank you for this presentation, Declan. I really like this idea of letting the lawn grow in order to um, cultivate more species, but I happen to live in an, in an association that is governed and where we have to cut the lawn. Is there anything else that you can suggest that I can do in order to encourage insects and biodiversity? Okay, I won't say move. Um, you, you, can, you can get involved in the association and you can try to change the culture. Um, I, I know exactly, you know, our, we, our neighborhood borders down on another one. One of our neighbors, you know, I, I just transfer in some of my lawn and I just put down cardboard, I put down wood chips and I killed a big patch of lawn and I've been putting in trees. I did it in a very methodical way so that it looks planned because it is planned, but I also want it to look like something that was intentional rather than McCabe just got tired of cutting the grass. So you can carve paths through and you can declare it a butterfly meadow and um, you know, you can put in signage. You can get free signage from that website, the uh, National Wildlife Federation, and you can explain that this is habitat. Now, one of my neighbors did this, and it irritated some of his other neighbors. So it's not simple, and, and neighborhood rules definitely do complicate this. But Ed, I think the best thing you could probably do is to try to change the culture by infiltrating the neighborhood association. <laughs> so that doesn't always work, though. Other questions? Okay, thanks all for coming, much appreciated. <laughs> <laughs>